This is not to make you nervous. I have like three and a half pages of notes, and we have uh, chapter 44 and half of chapter 45 to get into today, so we're diving right on in. Um, yeah, woohoo! Uh, a couple of things. Uh, thank you for, for uh, those of you that led us in worship today. It's the first time we've had a live band in, in some time, so thank you very, very much for that. I hope that you express your gratitude to them of uh, taking the time. I know they were practicing on Wednesday and practicing this morning, and uh, it was just fun to be able to... Uh, I told uh, uh, Zach when he came in, I was like, man, is it, I, I haven't heard you get to play drums in a while and to have Chris on the bass and uh, Jordan helping us out playing guitar and uh, the, uh, the faithfulness of Lauren and Missy week in and week out to continue to lead. So thank you for that. And uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, this is the group that is uh, up here that you get to see. But there is a, a wonderful, faithful uh, army of people that are back there that you need to be mindful of as well, that they're here <clears throat> week in and week out doing a variety of different things from a live stream uh, to the audio, to the lighting, to the words on the screen that you'll get to see in just a moment. Um, and so thank you all very much for, for what you do and taking that time. Yeah, it's a big deal. Um, and I, I guess I could say as a plug, I, and, uh, Missy and Lauren might appreciate this as well as Kirk, if you would like to serve in the back working and being trained on how to work the sound or the video or that kind of thing, we're always looking because we don't like to put it all just on a person of like, can you do this this week and this week and then for the end of time? If we can disperse the responsibility, it just, it makes it, it's on a rotation basis. So if some of you are like, I would really like to push the button that makes the screen go next. Uh, we will train you on that. And you might be like, do I need training? You do, because I, I tried to do that before. And uh, I, <laughs> well done. Um, I'm, I'm the guy that's singing back there, not paying attention. And I'm three slides behind and I'm like, uh oh. And so uh, it does require focus and training. And so if you got focus and you can be trained, uh, we will do so for you. And we would appreciate it very much. Um, as we dive in today, uh, man, I was, I was thinking about the fact that we're going to see an incredible revealing today and a reunion today. And I, I don't know about some of you, but there's been some interesting uh, reveal moments. Uh, this, this is certainly kind of dated a little bit, but uh, I can remember there was this show back in the day in the early 2000s-ish, I guess, maybe uh, the... Are they the aughts? It's such a weird thing to call it. But uh, there was this show called Extreme uh, Home Makeover, and there would be this home that would get this incredible makeover, and they would spend uh, a gratuitous amount of money on this one person's home when they could have maybe helped the whole neighborhood, but that's regardless. Anyway, so they would, they would make this extreme makeover, and they put a bus in front of the house, and they would have this chant at the end of the episode of move that bus and they drive the bus off and then uh, you would see their reaction of seeing their home being uh, incredible and brand new and all that kind of thing. And I remember those uh, moments of, of, of revelation. Uh, I can remember um, just the, the joy of whenever uh, I was standing by Dalton at, at his wedding in, in April, and uh, he was just in, in that anticipation of, uh, I love the fact that he and his family have these uh, doors put out in the middle of Kirk and Karen's yard. And uh, uh, Rachel had, had made her way to be behind those doors, and those opened up, and she's revealed, and Dalton gets to, to see her and just have that wonderful moment of, the, the, the revealing of his, of, of his bride. And um, I know most of you that were able to attend and be a part of that. Uh, it's interesting. Um, it seemed like years ago it was, I want to I wanna watch the bride. But now a lot of you, you like to watch the groom's reaction to the bride. And so you're kind of back and forth. Um, I, I got a little choked up. It was awesome. Um, and then I asked Tiffany, I was like, can you think of any other like uh, impressive, you know, revealing moments? And she said, she said, You've seen those videos on like YouTube or on Instagram or TikTok or whatever it may be, and there's the, the, the military dad who's been off serving our country overseas, and then they show up like in a classroom or like a gymnasium, and they surprise their child, and they haven't seen them in a long time. I was like, yeah, she's like, that. And, I, and she's like, you got to be dead inside not to get a little emotional whenever you see those moments of not just this incredible moment of, of this revelation of, oh, there you are. But in that specific example of not just the reveal, but also the reunion. And, and today, what we're looking at is, uh, in, in my study, and in, in what I've been looking at, th this to me is the, the climactic scene within the Joseph narrative. This is kind of what's been, been building, building up. And there's going to be kind of aftermath afterwards of what we look at in the weeks to come. But this, this moment of, of revelation that we've been building toward 
And as we do so, just as a reminder, uh, the last couple of weeks, without even intentionally like this is what we're going to look at, we've been looking a lot at the grace that Joseph has actually demonstrated toward uh, his brothers um, in some tangible ways. He's provided them their freedom to be able to go back home with food that he provided to them. Uh, He returned their money. Last week, we saw this incredible meal in his own home, in his own banquet hall that he provides uh, to his brothers. And today we're going to see grace, I believe, expressed again, perhaps in some ways in even a more profound and maybe even deeper level in in the realm of of forgiveness uh, demonstrated between Joseph toward his brothers. Now, as I said, we have a a lot of ground to cover. And so... um, it's not that what we're looking at on the front end in any means is, is unimportant. It's incredibly important, but uh, I'm, I am kind of wanting to build to get towards the end because there is so much uh, at the end that is just uh, so, so, so good. So uh, I need you to follow along with me. Uh, today be a good day. Maybe have a, uh, a pin out that you can highlight, underline things that jump off the page to you in your own copy of scripture. Uh, but let's, uh, let's take a look. Genesis chapter 44, beginning in verse 1. Then he commanded his house steward, this is Joseph, saying, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, that's Benjamin, and his money for the grain. And he, the steward, did as Joseph had told him. As soon as it was light, the men, the brothers, were sent away, they with their donkeys. Now, remember, they just had a night of uh, drinking and eating food freely. Like they've had a feast. A lot of commenters wonder if they're maybe a little bit hungover. Like this is, this has been a night that uh, they, they have enjoyed an unexpected meal and banquet with the vice Pharaoh of Egypt. And as a result, first thing in the morning, they wake up and they're making their way back as quickly as they can uh, to their homeland there in Canaan. And as they do so, Joseph has this other idea of something that he's wanting to do. Um, And so he, he begins to put a plan in action using his steward to do so. So verse four, they had just gone out of the city. So they're just barely outside of the city limits. And we're not far off when Joseph said to his house steward, up, follow the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? Is this, is not this the one from which my Lord drinks in which he indeed uses for divination? You have done wrong in doing this. So he overtook them and spoke these words to them. They said to him, why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold, the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks, this is talking about the first time they were in Egypt, we have brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? And then they make this hasty vow. With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die. And we also will be my Lord's slaves. So he said to them, now let it also be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave and the rest of you shall be innocent. So he kind of takes their, their, their vow of let the person who has it in his sack, the silver cup die. The rest of us will be slaves. The steward says, no, 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 we're, 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 there's going to be a consequence. The one whom, who was found will be the slave. The rest of you, you'll get to go. So then they hurried. Each man lowered his sack to the ground and each man opened his sack And he searched, beginning with the oldest, Reuben, and ending with the youngest, Benjamin. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and when each man loaded his donkey, they returned to the city. Now, he he had told them, the rest of you are innocent, you can go. But it's an interesting demonstration of, perhaps, I hope, the changed character of these brothers to recognize, yeah, Benjamin's been the one found with the silver cup, (laughs) Uh, but we're not going back home because we know what this is going to do to dad. Uh, We're going to go back with him into the city and stand before the vice Pharaoh, stand before their, their brother that they don't realize is their brother and he's alive. So verse 14, when Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there and they fell to the ground before him. So yet again, the fulfillment of Joseph's dream Back in Genesis 37, once again, they are bowing to Joseph, as they've done many times at this point. And Joseph said to them, now remember, he's talking through an interpreter. Joseph said to them, what is this deed that you have done? Do you not know that such a man as I can indeed practice divination? So Judah said, what can we say, my Lord? What can we speak? How can we justify ourselves? 
God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's slaves, both we and the one in whose possession the cup has been found. But he said, Joseph said, far be it from me to do this. The man in whose possession the cup has been found, he shall be my slave. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. Now, I think a fair question to ask at this point is, okay, why is Joseph doing this? Like, they just had a great time the night before having this banquet. But I think what we begin to see is there, there is this sense in which Joseph is wanting to remain connected with Benjamin. And I think, as we saw the last couple of weeks, I believe that there is a, still a, a testing that is taking place of Joseph toward his brothers. Of the hatred and the jealousy you had toward me... <clears throat> Is that going to be continued toward Benjamin? Has it been continued? Now, you've told me the truth that he was still alive. My father is still alive. Uh, You've told me the truth that you would bring him back. And they've done all these things. But I think there's a sense of if I put him, Benjamin, in harm's way, will you leave him to kind of leave him to, uh, to, to, to be hung out to dry, if you will, in order that you can kind of save your own skin? Because you were more than happy to, uh, at first, want to murder me and then throw me into a pit and then decided to sell me into slavery for what was good for, for you, of what you wanted. Will, will you actually be the kind of individuals that uh, you're going to recognize that we could pin all of this on Benjamin and we are free to go? Or are you going to be uh, men of character or not? And what's interesting is I've mentioned to you the last couple of weeks that Judah, who is the fourth born son of Jacob, not the first born, he's really the one that's kind of taking the lead of his brothers at this point, kind of being the spokesperson for them. He's leading the charge, which would be unusual. It should have been Reuben, but I think Reuben has disqualified himself from that kind of that position of previous acts that we've seen uh, in, in this story. But with, with, uh, with Judah, we begin to see him kind of rise up. And what's interesting is that verse, verse 16, there's a lot that we could unpack here but such an admonition of what they have done. There's a willingness of where he's saying, what can I say? What can we speak? How can we justify ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. What an incredible picture of us coming to an admonition of our guilt and our sin before a holy God, as opposed to coming into his presence and trying to justify yourself. You come into the presence of, of that person who is in authority, specifically when it comes into relationship in our relationship with God, it's an understanding of what can I say? Like, how can I try to speak myself out of this circumstance? Like I found it appears to be, to be guilty. I can't justify myself. And what a lot of commentators believe is that in verse 16, when it says, God has found out the iniquity of your servants, it's not just that uh, Judah is referring to the silver cup that has been found, but everything that they have experienced in life that we've seen from other passages of scripture is there's this sense of ever since what we did to our brother Joseph 22 years ago, anything that's kind of come about that's been hard or negative or difficult has been a direct result of that thing. Like our iniquity, our, our, our uh, consequence of our sin, like it, it's been found out and now we're kind of paying the piper at this point. Like there's, a, there's an, admitted, an admittance and a, and a recognition of, of taking ownership of what it is that they have done. But again, Joseph pushes the point. He's like, no, 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 you guys can go. You're free to go back to your father. But Benjamin stays here. And now beginning in verse 18, you might not find this interesting, but I find it interesting. And in beginning in verse 18, Judah speaks from verses 18 to 34. It's the longest... Um, um, I'm going to say monologue because I can't think of the right word, but it's the longest that anyone speaks uninterrupted in the entire book of Genesis. And it's the words of Judah. And you have to remember, yes, Judah's the fourth born. So it's kind of, well, why isn't Reuben doing it? But remember Judah, the individual that Andrew preached on a little while back from Genesis 38. Remember Judah, like we're, we're in the Joseph narrative starting in Genesis 37 and Joseph is sold into slavery. And then all of a sudden it's like the Joseph narrative just like screeches to a halt and it, the, the camera pans out <laughs> of Egypt and then zooms in over here to the land of Canaan. It's like, why are we looking at Judah? <laughs> and you see some incredibly icky and despicable things within the life of Judah and Tamar. It's this same guy 
that did some disturbing stuff with some disturbing actions and, and intentions. It's this guy that's about to speak, and you're about to see, again, I think just a, a, a changed individual by the time you get to the end of Genesis 38, and then you see him even kind of take it to, to this next level. I'm going to read this uninterrupted because uh, it's an uninterrupted monologue from, from Judah, and then we'll go back and take a look. Then Judah approached him and said, Oh, my Lord, may your servant please speak a word in my Lord's ear, and do not be angry with your servant, for you are equal to Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? We said to my Lord, We have an old father and a little child, uh, a little child of his old age. Now his brother is dead, so he alone is left of his mother, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. We said to my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. You said to your servants, however, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. Thus, it came about when we wept, uh, or excuse me, when we went up to your servant, my father, we told him the works of my Lord. Our father said, go back, buy us a little food. But we said, we, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down. For we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me. And I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I have not seen him since. If you take this one from, also from me, and harm befalls him, you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. Now therefore... When I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, when he sees that the lad is not with us, he will die. Thus your servant will bring gray hair of your servant, our father, down to Sheol in sorrow. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then let me bear the blame before my father forever. Now therefore, please... Let your servant remain instead of the lad, a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me? For fear that I see the evil that would overtake my father. Now, originally I intended for us to, to stop, and that's where we're going to end today. Um, and I, I think that does an, uh, an injustice to, uh, to the story. Uh, does an injustice to the story. But, but as you look at this section of scripture, this long uh, monologue from, from Judah, there's a few things that, that jump off the page to me that I find quite interesting. Is one, Joseph is getting kind of a, he's getting details of a story that he's not had all the details in so far. Like he's hearing conversations of, he, he knows that Judah and his brothers have come back to get more grain and they brought Benjamin with them, but he doesn't know the conversation that took place between Judah and his brothers and his father, Jacob. And so he's getting to hear a little bit of how, how, how is the circumstance for you guys to finally come back? Because it took him a while for them to finally return to the land of Egypt to get this grain and to get this food. And as this happens, one of the things that Judah is doing is he's acknowledging in verse 20 and in verse 27, there's an understanding that out of the mouth of their father, Jacob, is, yes, dad loves Joseph and Benjamin more than us. Which has to be just, you're dealing with, with the honest situation, but it doesn't sting any less. Whenever you are definitely not the, the most loved or favored child. I've known of individuals who have experienced that in the home that they were raised in, of mom and dad. I know that they love my sibling just a little bit more or a lot a bit more, and it's hard. It's, it's a difficult thing to, to navigate. But when he says in verse, in verse 20, my brother is, now his brother is dead, yet he's speaking to that same brother. He alone is left of his mother. Remember Jacob, his favorite wife was Rachel. She bore him two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. He even says in verse 27, your servant, my father said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. Can you imagine when Jacob says that to all the brothers that are sitting there 
of my wife bore me two sons. Like, there's 10, there's 10 others of us, like, standing in front of you. Like, are, are we not sons uh, from your, your other wives that, that are also your, your sons? It's also interesting in verse 28, whenever Joseph is telling this story, or Judah is telling this story, he, he's quoting his father Jacob, and Jacob makes the comment, surely the one that went out from me is torn to pieces. This is the first time that I imagine Joseph has wondered, why didn't dad come after me? But now he's hearing, oh, dad thought I was torn. Dad thought I was dead. He thought I was torn to pieces. Like there was some kind of scenario in which my brothers went back and obviously they didn't let him know that I was sold into slavery. They let it be uh, something to where he thought that I, I had been, I've been killed. And so he kind of has this light bulb moment of, oh, so that's what you think happened to me, dad. That's what you thought took place. But as it, as it builds towards this, Judah is, he's, he's submissive, he's subservient to this vice Pharaoh, he's doing everything that he can to articulate the situation and the need for, yes, by all accounts, it appears that this bad thing has taken place, the silver cup was stolen from you, and it, it looks like it's going to be pinned on our brother Benjamin, but oh, don't, don't, don't let it be. I, I, I need to intercede in this moment, and this is exactly... This is exactly what, it, what happens. Judah begins to speak up and he begins to say things like, let me bear the blame. He says, let your servant remain instead of the lad. I'll be the slave. Let the lad go. Like he has a genuine concern for his father Jacob out of what would take place within this, which he didn't have before when it came to Joseph 22 years before. He didn't care how his dad was going to respond to this. He just wanted to deal with Joseph and his hatred for him. So he, Judah has a concern for both Jacob and for Benjamin. And it's interesting because the words that he's saying here are so identical to what he said back in Genesis 37. In Genesis 37, he's one of the brothers who says, here comes this dreamer, let's kill him. What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Let's sell him to a slave trader. This is the same guy. And yet 22 years later, through all the life experience that he's had, there comes this point where he's saying, let me take the place of Benjamin. Let me stand in that gap. Let me be that substitute to where you want him, take me, because it can't be this way. I can't do this to Benjamin. I can't do this to my dad. I will stand in the gap. Let there be this exchange. Put his guilt, put, 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 put his problem, put his issue, put it all upon me, because I, I've made a pledge I said, I would be surety for the lad. Like I've made a promise and I'm going to see it through to the end. There's just a beautiful picture here that we're about to see of, of, of really of just this picture of Christ that's found in the person of Judah. And again, if we, if we, if we ended there today, you, you could leave with kind of the, you know, to be continued and dun, 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 what's going to take place. But I believe it's at this point, it's interesting, it's at this point that we're about to jump into chapter 45 of where Joseph has, he, he, he's, he's heard what he needs to hear. He's seen what he needs to see. He's seen someone, one of the brothers who hated him and wanted him nothing but dead or sold into slavery, willing to say, no, 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 no. We could pin it on Benjamin. We could go back to our father and be like, sorry, dad. You know, Benjamin stole some stuff. And so I think Joseph, again, is putting them to this test and Judah passes the test. He's like, no, 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 it can't be Benjamin. And so verse 45, then Joseph could not control himself. Upon these words of Judah, Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood before him. And he cried, have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And then Joseph said to his brothers, again, interpreter is out of the room. Then Joseph says to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my brother still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. You think? <laughs> Joseph identifies himself because I think he's so moved by this point. Like he's already wept a few different times in seeing his brothers. But hearing these words of Judah, of I'll be the substitute, I'll take the place of Benjamin, who is the one who appears to be guilty, so that he doesn't have to deal with the consequence of what it is that he has done. And so I'll take the place. And Joseph is overcome. He weeps so loudly that the Egyptians hear it. Pharaoh's household hears it. And this isn't one of those, like, you know, just dab a little bit of tears off of his eyes and he's choked up. Like, he, he's weeping. 
He's overcome with emotion. Like he's finally reached that breaking point of what it is that he's experiencing just kind of welling up within him. And when he says, I'm Joseph, his brothers can't believe it because this guy, you, you, it says they're dismayed, like they're speechless. They're stunned. They're terrified. And what I love is that Joseph comes up behind this point and he says, verse four, then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. Again, I can't help but think of Christ. Please come closer to me. They came closer and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. At that point, I think the light bulb turns on of like, no one would know that. Like we have kept this deep, dark secret even from dad. No one can know this unless you're the one that we did this to. I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, do not be grieved. Do not be angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Listen to this. For God sent me before you to preserve life. What? For the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. So again, it's been 22 years at this point since he was sold into slavery. He's gone through all the stuff that he's gone through. Verse 7 and this is one of those moments where if you have a pen or, or, or pencil or highlighter, verse 5, God sent me before you. Verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he, he, God, has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord to all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will also provide for you. For there are still five years of famine to come and you and your household and all that you have would be impoverished. Behold, your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth which is speaking to you. There's, there's no interpreter. Now you must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt and all that you have seen, and you must hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother's Benjamin's neck and he wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. And then he kissed all his brothers and wept on them. And afterwards, his brothers, that's when they began to speak up. They began to talk with him. The tapestry that God has been weaving since Genesis 37, on one side, it looks like this jumbled mess of, of knots and just chaos. But it's like at this point, Joseph is able to almost see like that tapestry has been reversed and he can see with clarity the beautiful weaving that God has put in place through his sovereign design and plan. That though, yes, you went through this mess of stuff, Joseph, that was an injustice to you, sold into slavery and uh, uh, falsely accused and thrown into prison unjustly and all these different things. Yes, that's all happened to you and it's a mess and it's a knot and it's horrible and, it's, and, and it doesn't appear to be fair. But God is, is declaring and Joseph is recognizing and seeing with clarity in this moment and, and proclaiming this to his brothers of, you may not see it, but I can see the sovereign hand of God at work the gracious hand of God at work, not just in my life. I don't want to just make this a personal thing about me. This is for all of us, even the ones who sold me into slavery. Like this doesn't surprise God. This isn't outside of his realm of power or influence. He's not all of a sudden out of control in this situation. God's plan is at work in order that we as a people would be preserved because here's the beautiful thing, in the same way that Judah makes the promise that I will be a pledge or a promise of surety to my dad, that I will make sure Benjamin is taken care of, there's been a pledge and a promise all the way back in Genesis 3.15 of the moment of the first gospel, the proto-euangelion, of there's going to be a seed that comes from the woman and he will crush the head of the serpent. And God says that will happen. 
There will be an opportunity. There will be a moment where I will intervene and mankind will be able to be redeemed and forgiven of their guilt and their trespass and their sin by the promised one who is to come. And all of the nation of Israel is waiting for this. And the world known to them is waiting for this promised Messiah to come to be that pledge and that promise. And God recognizes for me to be true to my word and to make sure that the seed of this woman comes to fruition, then I got to preserve this people. And it's this beautiful picture of the, of the gracious hand of God, not just here, but all throughout biblical history, all the way up to the coming of Jesus as he's born, lives the life, uh, <laughs> dies the death that we deserved, and raises again. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture of, of the gospel. But as, but as I mentioned When he tells his brothers to come closer to him, when he speaks to them, he says, don't be grieved or angry. All the different times of God sent me, God sent me, God has made me, all these different things. The the, the part that jumped off the page to me is in verse 8. He says, therefore, it is not you who sent me here, but God. Just those two words, just that little phrase. And as he's doing this, As he's kissing them, as he's weeping over them, he's telling them, don't be afraid, come near. He's not only in this moment demonstrating grace by means of of forgiveness of what they have done. The wonderful thing is it's not just like it's okay or it's good or you're, you're, you're forgiven. It's yes, you are forgiven, but I want you to live. I want you to have a life. There's still five more years of famine and hardship. And the beautiful picture that we have in our relationship with Christ is sometimes, and this is great, we can get so focused on Jesus died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. Yes. But it's not just that we, we do. We need the forgiveness of sin, but he doesn't just say, all right, I'm taking your sin away and placing it upon myself. He's also saying, I'm substituting myself that you might have life and life abundant. Did you see all the pictures of the things that, that, that Joseph says that you're going to have? You're going to the land of, live in the land of Goshen. Your children, your children's children, your flock, like, I'll provide for you. Like, there's still five years of famine. Like, I'm going to make sure that you're not just forgiven, but that you have life while you still live on this earth. I, I wrote it down in these four different ways. From Judah's monologue all the way through, through what we've read in uh, Genesis 45 are these four things. <laughs> Such a picture of Christ. One, Jesus is your substitute. Two, Jesus extends grace. Three, Jesus forgives. Four, Jesus provides life and life abundant. That's the picture of what we see of Christ in this story. The substitutionary atonement of Christ, the grace of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ, and not just to leave us there, which would be more than enough. He says, here's life and life abundant that you might live it's, it's interesting because even think of whenever Christ, because for the brothers here in this story, this is very much to them, a dead man has kind of come back to life. Like, I thought you were dead. And he reveals himself and they're astonished. I can't help but think of the upper room of the disciples of when Jesus is like, here I am. It's like, they're, they're kind of dismayed. They're, they're like, I can't believe it. They're speechless. And what I love is it says in John chapter 20, verse 21, as God has sent me, so I send you. In the same passage in Genesis, Joseph is all about God has sent me, God has sent me, God has sent me. And now what does he say? Don't leave this information with yourself. Now I'm sending you. Go tell dad. Go to dad. Go to the rest of our family. Let them know I'm alive. Let them know life is available for you here. I will provide for you. I've made a way for you. God made this possible. It's an incredible, incredible picture of the coming of Messiah. So, a couple of things I want to close with. We've talked about a word of instruction and a word of hope. Two words of instruction. When you see this, I believe that, one, you see that God is in control. God sent me. God made me. This is not only true, I think, within Joseph's life, but I believe this is true within our life. It's true of you and me. God sends us. God makes us. What's difficult with that something that I wrestle with at different times is, but why would you do it this way? 
I wonder if I was Joseph. In fact, I believe I would if I was Joseph. Be like, okay, awesome. You preserved our people. Did I really have to be thrown into prison for the preservation to take place? Did, did I really have to be thrown into a pit? And that's where we want to ask those questions because we, we don't see it, we don't understand. And it's not to be a cop-out, but it makes me go to a passage like one that you've heard before of Isaiah 55. Your th- for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. There are things within this life that, especially in the moment, I cannot perceive. I can't understand the why. The beauty is that Joseph gets a moment of clarity here of like, oh, I see it. (laughs) Like, I see the purpose within the pain of what I've experienced. And for some of you, there might be some pain that you have experienced or are currently experiencing, and you're like, okay, awesome. What's the purpose? And I know different moments in my life that, as I've I've talked with Tiffany, there have been some painful experiences that I've gone through that I'm like, maybe I don't see the purpose in pain this side of heaven. But I believe in how you've revealed yourself to me is that you were good, that you were worthy to worship, that you're worthy to trust. Because what doesn't really make sense it's okay, God, you're God. Why, why did you have to send your son? Why did he have to die? Why did he have to be scourged? Why did he have to do all these things? Is there not another means in another way? And he says, no, this is the way. And when I truly try to wrap my mind around what it is that he was willing to accomplish and the pain that he was willing for his own son to experience and go through, that we might know forgiveness of sin and his father be glorified. There's some of that that is just like, it baffles the mind. But I see that there's purpose in the pain. So I'm going to choose to believe that if there is purpose in the pain for my salvation, there's purpose in the pain of what I'm going through even now, even if I don't see it. I, I remember when Tiffany and I were going through some hardship, I was doing a lot of study on pain and suffering. <laughs> and I, I, remember, I remember one person writing, I think it's good to ask the questions of why because you're wrestling with this. You're trying to understand. And I remember reading something that for me was a bit of a salve of even if I got the why, it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, take away the pain. The pain would still be there. And a hard thing to wrestle with as we travel through hardships within this life is what is the purpose behind this? What, what if I could get the answer? What if I could see with clarity or oh, that God sent me so that there would be a preservation of our people and for the promised seed of the Messiah? But it wouldn't, it wouldn't take away what Joseph still experienced and what he went through and the injustices that he had. So the only thing that I can do is I can look at the faithfulness of God and the examples throughout Scripture and throughout church history and be like, you know what? I've counted the costs. And I believe that it's worth it to follow him regardless. That I will be faithful because what he has promised me and what he has extended to me is far more than I actually deserve. And so thank you, Lord, for what I have. So God is in control. There are different psalmists that as they cry out to God when they're going through pain, when they're going through suffering, there was one in particular this week that I was reading that just stood out to me, Psalm 13. Listen to the honesty of the psalmist as they're going through hardship and pain, and they don't get it. This is David. He says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me? You ever been that honest with God? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Like, say something. (laughs) Enlighten my eyes or I will sleep with the sleep of death. And my enemy will say I have overcome him and my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord. 
Why? How? Because he has dealt bountifully with me. In some of the most difficult moments within my life, I feel like I've, without even meaning to, I've echoed the psalm of of a David like this. Will you forget me forever? But the beautiful picture of these psalms of lament is that when they come to the end and they've done some honest wrestling with God, is when they come to the end and they choose, even in their pain and in their brokenness and even in their heartache, when they choose to come into the presence of God, it's as if (laughs) it's the way that it's designed that God begins to, to let you see him. And there's a change of like, I don't get it, but God. Oh, but God, I have trusted you. Oh, but God, you are gracious. Oh, but God, there's loving kindness. Oh, but God, you are salvation. I will sing to you. Even if it's with tears down my face, I will sing to you. I'm still confused. Oh, but I will praise you because you're worthy to be praised. Because look at what you have done for me in my life. Look at what you have provided for me in my life. You're so gracious. I don't get it, Lord, but I trust you. Second word of instruction. The one who has received grace extends grace. The one who has received grace extends grace. You see this within the life of Joseph with his brothers here. He hugs them. He weeps upon them. He says to come closer. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be grieved. Don't be angry. There's a reconciliation of reunion that's taking place here. I think he's one who is, he's seen the extended hand of grace with, of God within his own life. And so it's fitting that he would extend that. It's what we would see in the new Testament in Ephesians four, verse 31 Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other. Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And extending grace at times and and forgiving others can be a difficult thing to do. But if I have truly known grace, then I should be one who should extend it. To not seems to be a, a contradiction in terms. One of my favorite stories of an example of this Some of you know of Corrie ten Boom. She was saving Jewish people from the Nazis during World War II. In the process, she's discovered and she's imprisoned along with her sister. And they're sent to a concentration camp. Corrie watched her sister Betsy wither in her health and eventually die within that concentration camp. Corrie survived and she began to travel the world to tell large groups about the grace of God. Though she went through that horror... And that the grace of God will forgive anyone. Well, the year was 1947 when Corey spoke at a church in Munich, Germany, where the topic was on forgiveness. And the German people were really wrestling with this issue because of what so many within the German government had done. So she began to speak from her heart about the need to forgive those who have hurt and wronged you. She even recalled her own experiences within that concentration camp called Ravensbrück. It was, she said, quote, it was the truth they needed to hear. It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed out land. And I gave them my favorite mental picture. When we confess our sins, God casts them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. Following her presentation, most of the people, these Germans, were so overwhelmed by the message that they actually left the church in relative silence. But there was one man who stayed behind to speak to her. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück at that concentration camp. He began to work his way forward as many others were leaving. And she says, in one moment, I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, I saw a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush. This huge room with its overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking without any clothes past this very man. And I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me. Ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, oh, how thin you were. Now he is in front of me. His hand is thrust out. And he says, a fine message, Fräulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And she says, I, who had spoken so glibly on forgiveness, began to fumble in my pocketbook rather than take the hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. And it was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to just freeze. He said, you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. I was a guard there. 
she very quickly realizes he does not remember me. He continued, but since that time, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear from you as well, Fräulein. And again, his hand came out. Will you forgive me? I stood there. I who sins <laughs> have every day to be forgiven, and I could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow and terrible death simply by asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do, for I had to do it. I knew that. And still I stood there with coldness clutching my heart, but forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of your heart. Silently I prayed, Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder. It raced down my arm. It sprang into our joint hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Truly, the one who has received grace extends grace. So those are words of instruction. I have a word of hope. In fact, there are two words. It's perhaps what jumped off the page more to me than anything else is in verse 8. It is not you who sent me here, but God. But God. My mind immediately went to a small group meeting our first semester we ever started small groups. And we were studying through the book of Ephesians. And we got to Ephesians chapter 2. And I, I just want to read to you from Ephesians 2 a passage that I've read and studied and even preached on many times, and it just, the discussion that we had in that small group setting brought this alive in a way that just never had before. In Ephesians 2, verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgression, oh, he made us alive. I couldn't help but think when I read Joseph this, God sent, God made. How? Oh, but God. He seated us with him in the heavenly places so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us. So the question might be, but how could I extend that kind of grace? How could I forgive someone within my life? How can I traverse and travel through this pain and this hardship and the suffering? Perhaps those two words, I pray that they're not empty religious gesture, but I pray that they will be a comfort to you, but God. Like Judah, Jesus stepped in. Judah said, instead of the lad, me. How are we able to extend grace and forgive? But Jesus stepped in. But God demonstrated his mercy. But God was gracious. 
Jesus, who is grace personified, extends grace to each and every one of you today. Will you receive his grace? Will you receive his mercy? Will you receive his forgiveness? Will you know his love today? And I pray that you will, that your story could have within it, this is what I was. I was just craving the world and the things of this world and the lust of this world. And I didn't really know where I was going, but God intersected in my life. And I knew his love and his grace and his mercy. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? Does your story have within it but God? Maybe your story, you're a Christ follower, but you need to be reminded, oh, but God has intervened in your life. Oh, but God shows you grace beyond grace and mercy beyond mercy that really can't even wrap our minds around. And so perhaps, like the psalmist David in Psalm 13, you may feel a certain way. Or like Corey, you may feel a certain way. But because of God, I'm asking you, Lord, that I will be faithful. Can you, can you provide? Can you provide that, that, that feeling? Can you provide that presence that only you can? And so in just a second, we're going to sing a, a very familiar hymn of old of great is thy faithfulness. I understand I, I've tried to sing this song years ago when I was going through some stuff and I was like, ooh, I can sing it, but do I mean it? Maybe without realizing it, and I didn't phrase it this way, the Lord took me back to, but God. But God's mercy, but God's faithfulness, but God's graciousness, but his forgiveness, but his love. And so maybe the most powerful thing you could do is you hear this song sung. Is maybe begin to just dwell and meditate upon what God has done in your life. And to thank him for it. Others of you, there may be a hurt a violation against you, an injustice. And I'm not saying that it's easy. It wasn't easy for Corey. I can't imagine that it was probably necessarily easy for Joseph. I mean, it took him a while to get to this point. But will you extend grace and forgiveness to those who have wronged you? Or on the flip side, would you be like a Judah who says we are guilty? Would you be like the guard at Ravensbrook and say, will you forgive me if you know you've wronged someone? Hmm. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the fact that you do intervene. We thank you for your mercy and grace and love within our life. I pray that we would know it, experience it in a way that just doesn't make sense, that even supersedes, honestly, even our feelings and our emotions, that it's just the truth permeating within our very being. And I pray this in Jesus' name.